We're going to keep rolling. We are cramming here, just like our students in Michigan. Doug Ross uh, challenged us this morning to think in terms of education reform through the prism of the 2018 election, whether you are a Republican or a Democrat or independent, to challenge our candidates this year to have serious plans on how to address the issues we're talking about today. My name is John Bebo. I'm president and CEO of the Center for Michigan, and I will welcome our next panel to the stage. I will introduce them um, as they are getting mic'd up here. As with all of our panelists throughout the day today, uh, full biographies of all of our speakers are in your agendas uh, on your tables today. But I will introduce them as they're getting mic'd up here. Dave Campbell is the superintendent of the Kalamazoo Regional Education Service Agency and is also a member of the Governor's 21st Century Education Commission. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. I think Eileen Weiser will be stepping up next. Eileen is a member of the State Board of Education. Welcome, Eileen. John Ricolta with Wallbridge and the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children. Dan Varner with Goodwill Industries, the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children, and the uh, founder, I believe, of Excellent Schools Detroit. Welcome, Dan. And finally, Michigan's current reigning Teacher of the Year, Luke Wilcox. Luke and I were just talking in the hall, and uh, he, he, he uh, embraces the responsibility of, after all of the policy talk, saying, this is what it's really like in front of our students. So thank you all for being here today. Um, an open question to start our panel to all of our panelists. You heard the, the, the evidence in our opening panel. Um, we're failing our kids. We're falling behind other states. The data seems clear in that regard. Uh, what is your reaction? Well, John, we'll start right here with you. With you me? don't hold back. Go ahead. I don't. Um, I, I think it's really quite simple. You've been studying this issue for two decades. We all know, I mean, I don't know how many more studies you actually need to know that you have a gigantic crisis on your hands. And quite frankly, and I include myself in this, you lack the courage to go out and do what you have to do. It's as simple as that. We are at war, economic war across the whole United States and across the globe. And if we don't have the talent to be able to compete, you will continue to see the standard of living of everybody in Michigan go down. And uh, I think the coalition, to me, served as an excellent example how you can bring an incredible number of different kind of people together to go and fight for something that was important. And in that particular case, it was the very existence of the Detroit public school system. And you would have never thought in a million years that John Ricolta and David Hacker could put aside the 20 or 30 percent of the problems that we'll never agree on and focus on the 70. And we developed trust, transparency, and a method where we could go up to Lansing. And who would have ever thought that we could have gotten the Republican-led legislature to write a check for $625 million for the Detroit public school system. So don't tell me it can't be done. You just can't be having conference after conference after conference. You've got to go out there and start to cause some trouble. <laughs> well, John Ricolta and David Hecker, don't stop with what you did a couple of years ago. There's plenty more problems you can solve. Please keep going. David? I think my key message would be, let's do a root cause analysis. 
if we can remember one thing, we need to do a root cause analysis on why we are in the bottom fifth in every metric, okay? And I've been doing root causes analysis as an educator in the state for 25 years, as a high school principal, K-12 soup, and now ISD soup, do them all the time. And every, every major problem that I see comes down to poor decision making, okay? Now you're wondering, geez, he's a school administrator, some of those decisions are his. Our structures and systems don't make sense. They, they fight against each other. We compete against each other. We have teachers against boards. We have, we have ISDs versus locals. We have, uh, we have a, a, a fairly weak uh, system at the state level. Uh, of, of governance, and governance matters a great deal. Massachusetts mentioned it, Tennessee mentioned it, and, and our system of governance is not designed to produce a high level of performance at a state level. So does it matter? Yes, it does. Governance matters because governance is simply decision making. If you think we have a funding problem, that's a governance problem. If you think we have an accountability problem, and we do, it's a governance problem. Everything goes down to the decision making bodies. And by the way, I'm not taking any shots at the State Board of Education. They were depowered 20 years ago by executive order. They were not re-empowered by Governor Granholm when she had eight years to do so by an executive order. She could have done so. So I, this is not a, an attack on the state board, but I think it's time for us to do a very deep look at how should the Michigan's systems, and that's a plural term now, we have systems of education in this state. We don't have a system, and we need to create one to support a million and a half kids. Dan, you come at this from multiple perspectives. I do. I have the privilege and honor of running Goodwill Industries of Greater Detroit, so I get a chance to work with adults, frankly, who were failed by uh, the system years ago, uh, and have had the privilege of leading excellent schools Detroit. I wasn't the founder. It was a founding coalition um, uh, that I was a part of, uh, but have had the privilege to work on K-12 public education issues as well, both there and at the State Board of Education um, for a period of time. Uh, I'll tell you what I think about um, there's so many different challenges to be addressed, and I, you've heard some articulation of them. I don't think I need to pile on there. What I will say is I just want to remind folks kind of what's at stake. When I mean, we talk about this as an economic imperative, when we talk about it in terms of competing with other folks, like there is a, there is a unique individual human cost associated with this. There are individual children, your children, my children, who are impacted horrifically by the system that we have set up and are arguing about. Like that's, that we gotta keep in mind as we're having this conversation. At the end of the day, e adults' egos have to get set aside so that we just agree on something, the first 20% of something to try and help our kids actually achieve what they're capable of. And right now, we are failing that. We are failing our children. Eileen, do you agree with the notion that we're failing our children? Oh, I absolutely do. Uh, I've just been cornered by a friend in the back of the room who said, Eileen, are you running for State Board of Education again? And I said, no, uh, because I think I can do better outside the system unless the system changes. Uh, <laughs> uh, because I'm not running? Wait, let's... Are <laughs> 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 you sure? In fact, that's part of the problem. Some of you who voted for me had no idea you were voting for me, uh, which is an issue. But it, this is a national problem that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, did I knock this? Oh my goodness. It sounds like it works. And we are failing Eileen's microphone is what's failing. Just hold it. Here we go. I, I, this is a national problem that we're having right now. I want to be really clear about that. Uh, in 2012, we broke out results for our millennials on something called the PIAC, which is a, an assessment of adult competencies. 33 developed countries, fifth from the bottom for our millennials in um, uh, our own language, uh, literacy, second from the bottom in problem solving, and bottom in digital numeracy. And what we do is that we focus on rote memorization. We don't, uh, we don't let children learn to elaborate, which is what other countries who are doing better than we are on PISA do. Um, we don't look for problem solving and critical thinking. We don't nurture children to become lifelong learners. We memorize. And with the advent of the internet and the fluency that our kids have with their thumbs, they can find the data. They need to learn how to manage it and use it or else they won't be able to have jobs in the future. 
Um, I, you look at the uh, USDOE, which recently quoted a specialist who say that 40% of the jobs that these kids will face by the year 2025 have not yet been invented. We can't envision them. Uh, right now, Columbia is putting uh, stem cells on molar scaffolding, putting it in your jaw, and within nine weeks you will have a new molar connected to your body. So we, we have a responsibility uh, in this state to come up with a new culture that every child is able to move through the system, become a lifelong learner, and not be focused on one area or another, or not be focused on menial labor, but be able to move fluidly back and forth as life demands in the coming time. We're not even looking at that. And the governor is, the legislature is. The State Board of Ed does not do that work. Luke, I don't think this was intentional. It's more serendipity, but I'm glad a teacher gets the last word on some of this. Yeah, so I, uh, I guess I am here today to try and give you some of the like on the ground footwork uh, ideas about what's what's happening in, in actual classrooms. And, you know, I interact with students every day and I talk to teachers every day. And I'll tell you the, the part that bothers me the most about everything that we've we heard this morning is that if you were to tell me that you're from you, you represent a certain high school and you told me the free and free uh, the percent of students that are free and reduced lunch from your high school. I could pretty darn accurately predict what your proficiency rates would be, based simply on that. And to me, that's unacceptable. That, that's the part of this that really like, drives my, my work as, a, as an educator, this, this equity piece of, of trying to uh, get high quality education for, for all students. And I, I think that there's, I'm, I'm gonna throw out three ideas of what, what I, I think are high leverage points and they've all been mentioned already this morning, but I'm gonna attach a little bit of a story that's actually from a school or a classroom to each one of those ideas. So the first idea is the, is the funding between uh, the advantage and the disadvantaged schools. And we've seen the data for that, we know what that looks like, but I've seen what the classrooms look like. In this year as Michigan Teacher of the Year, I've had the amazing opportunity to get around to like dozens of schools around the state. And I can tell you there are huge differences just in the, the quality of the classrooms and the buildings when you go to Detroit Public Schools or I go to East Grand Rapids Schools. And, and that is not okay, that is not acceptable. And, and part of the way we can have an impact on that is in the funding structures that, that, that we use. That's governance, you got it. The next thing that I think is really important that was mentioned this morning is about attracting talent to the profession of teaching and then retaining that talent, keeping those teachers in, in the uh, educational world. And this is especially important for those struggling schools, for the inner city schools, because I know from sitting on the State Board of Ed that all of our partnership schools, which are the low performing schools in the state, the, the message is clear from all of those schools. We have trouble retaining our teachers. We invest in our teachers, they leave. We invest in our teachers, they leave. How, how can those schools be successful if they're not attracting the best talented teachers and retaining those teachers? So what systems can we put in place that will provide uh, uh, some sort of uh, advantage for the best teachers to go to some of the, the more, the, the tough, tough schools to go into? And then finally, this idea of teacher leadership, which I know Tennessee has done some amazing work on this idea of teacher leadership. I think we need to move away from this us versus them, teachers versus administrators idea, which is, is so common. I, I visited so many schools this year, and you talk to teachers, and they'll talk bad about the administrators, and you talk to the administrators, and they'll talk bad about the teachers. Yep. And the reality is, we have the same goals. We want the success of our students, so how can we, how can we go after that common goal? And, and I think that teacher leadership is that, is that mediator between teachers and administrators that can help to align the goals and the visions of the, of the schools. And so I'm excited about some of the work that Tennessee has done to acknowledge uh, the teacher leadership, to develop teacher leadership. And I, I think that that's a high leverage point moving forward in the state of Michigan. Thank you very much. It's easy to be empathetic to John Rocolta's frustration with studies. Uh, a year and a half ago, Eileen and Dave, you, you put a lot of time and effort into the Governor's Commission report, which came out and was expansive. Uh, had a $2 billion a year price tag on it, called for dozens of changes to what we do in education, had an urgent message that we're failing our children and we must act. Uh, and outside of uh, quite a bit of discussion about um, getting rid of the state board, not a lot of action in the Capitol Dome on that report. Why and what is it going to take? 
I think what it's going to take is to, to focus on the most important things, which is the decision-making processes. So, John, I'm going to ask you a question, if you don't mind. If the Center for Michigan were completely dysfunctional and, poor, and poor, performing What makes poorly, you think it's not? Oh, it's not. You guys are doing very well for this state. Uh, but if it was very dysfunctional, would it matter to you if, you, if your board was chosen out of the, or your decisions were made by a, a term limited legislature? Does that matter? Does it matter who's on your board? Does it matter that, that the state board would be chosen out of the party conventions, an inherently partisan political place? We need less politics and more really good policy centered on kids. I'm not sure why everything hasn't been embraced. A lot of things have been, a lot of things were in the works. The, 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 the governance recommendation, uh, I would personally recommend starting at the top, starting at the state board, to reconstitute it, to, to make it a body that is very credible. At this point, whether they deserve it or not, they will not be empowered again. Very similar to what Doug Ross said this morning about continuity, very similar to what our friends in Tennessee exactly. said about continuity over exactly. the past two gubernatorial Exactly. So Tim Kelly has a resolution to abolish them. I disagree with that. Tim's willing to talk about, well, then if not abolish them, then how should they be elected? How should they be elected? If it's not out of the party conventions, then how? I gave a handout, it's at everybody's table. Here's six ways that more, uh, more effective states uh, select their state boards, if they have one, not every state even has one. If you go to the next page, uh, on page two, there's, there's some very powerful quotes in here that are written by national level uh, leaders across the political spectrum. Uh, here's, here's, a, here's a great quote. Uh, if you can put the cooks in the kitchen slide up, it might help us a little bit here. It says in, uh, let's see here, in top performing systems, either the state or the national level, there's a place where the buck stops. You heard Doug Ross say that earlier. That has responsibility for policy making, management functions, directly related to education, and can be held accountable for design and functioning in the system. Up on the screen, I don't have it in your handout, but we've got a, we've got a, a little graphic that we made to, uh, to exemplify, there we go, the cooks in the kitchen. So let's look at the quote at the top. It's, it's that there are so many cooks in the education kitchen that no, nobody is really in charge. Nobody's really in charge, and that is a consequence of an antiquated governance structure that practically forces all the cooks to enter and remain in the kitchen. It's Michael Petrelli from the Fordham Institute. And then you've got Mark Tucker's quote that I just read to you. Those are the, the underpinnings of an effective system that can deliver results to kids. That's how you recruit and retain outstanding educators, is creating a system that will recruit and retain 100,000 outstanding educators, which is what we need. Ontario's figured it out. Many top performing nations have figured it out. We can look at their systems. We can learn from them and michigan dies them, not copy-paste them. Eileen, you're another cook in the kitchen. Tried to start my own kitchen because that, that seems to be a better way of doing things. So uh, I would, um, uh, Dave and Doug and I served, uh, I, I kind of look at them as my argument bro brothers. You know, these are the guys who look at me and say, you're not doing your job. And I say, I serve with decent people who are elected through a partisan convention system. And when you are elected that way, you are partisan when you take office. So it has nothing to do with the individuals, it's mm -hmm. simply the system. But I would say, John, in comment, a response to your question about what's been enacted and what's going on with the commission, um, there are things. The, the ADA Alpha accountability system, which I view as critical, we are not informing parents. The system that we have with the dashboard, if you look at elementary schools, the last time I did three weeks ago, doesn't show third grade reading results. Ann Arbor had 39% of its third graders not reading proficiently enough to do fourth grade work. And if you can't get that on the state dashboard, where are you going to get it as a parent? Um, <laughs> they didn't, the, the dashboard doesn't have third, fourth, and fifth grade M-step results. Again, very hard to get it if you can't get it easily. Um, so the ADF accountability system, I think, is really important, uh, ADE, actually. Teacher preparation, uh, uh, you couldn't get Tim Kelly here today if you tried, because he's chairing the House Education Reform Committee, where eight bills have been dropped to address better teacher preparation and better professional learning. And they're revolutionary. One of them, and Elizabeth Moji I know is coming, one of them 
uh, requires ed schools to take their candidates back if they can't get a satisfactory achievement rating in the first three years of teaching and, and, and re-educate them. This is huge stuff. The Marshall Plan, uh, within the commission report, was a section on competency-based learning, where children move through education in the same number of years, but they have more time on subjects that they don't do well, and they can take less time on ones they do well. You can be in third grade and be doing second grade math and fifth grade reading. So uh, mastery learning, though, is that you have to know and be able to use 80% of a concept before you move on. So you, you just gave Bridge a bunch more stories we have to chase. So thank <laughs> yes. you. So that's um, the John. Just one, one last thing. The governance issue. Um, the, the, we hire and fire the state superintendent. If the governor belongs to a different party than controls the State Board of Education, that person serves in their cabinet. It's an untenable situation. Our last two superintendents have, have had cancer. It is horrible. So I, I beg you to consider everything that Dave's saying. John and Dan, you're both part of the, the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children. I hope you'll tell everybody here a little bit about it. It has very ambitious goals for change here in Detroit. And I'd like to pose a, a question. Um, our, we're going to be in Grand Rapids tomorrow, where a lot of regional efforts are underway. And you're, you're essentially doing a local effort here. Reform, is it best scalable at the regional level, or must it happen at the state level? But first, tell us a little bit about the, the coalition. OK. But I first want to say that the way we elect and manage the Board of Education, the superintendent vis-a-vis -vis the legislature and the governor is totally flawed, period. And you can only look at, we have plenty of laws on the books that we're not invoking. The SSRO, this is one of the things the coalition looked at. One of my big things is we haven't closed a public school for academic reasons in Detroit ever. We closed them for academic, uh, uh, financial reasons, but never for academic reasons. I don't even like this, the word close. Reorganize, reconstitute. We're not talking about closing the school and making it go away. We have to do something differently. And that should be the first step, but we ought to not let that be the excuse for doing nothing. And this is when I come back to this courage and discipline and strength and intensity and passion. I want to know how many business people are on the audience today. I'll bet you there's not what, one, two, three. You're, you're, talking to, you're talking to yourselves. You know, this is the choir. You need to get out of the church and into the public. You need to start demonstrating. You need to do something. Okay, let's go back to Cole Bishop. <laughs> Uh, um, I, that was good for TV, and, okay. and this is on TV today, so okay, thank you. Okay, good. My wife will uh, have nice hot dinner for me when I get home today. <laughs> you asked me the question about whether it should be local, regional, and state. And I believe it has to start at the local level. And people like me have to do the following. We have to go to the schools ourselves as business people and see how the failure is manifesting itself. We have to go and ride the school bus and find out how difficult it is for people who want to go to charter school to get their kids to school. I went and did that. And they wrote a bunch of stories about it. We have to go and visit special education, those center-based schools, and see how, how wonderful they're performing, but how that is draining money out of the classrooms of the regular kids. Our funding is totally upside down. We have to engage with the administrators and the principals. The business community has to. Because we have the power in Lansing. We raise the money. We provide the jobs. We need the students to come to work for us. You have to engage business. And this is why business leaders for Michigan did this. Because if not, we have to go outside. You realize that just in the electrical union in Detroit itself, if you wanted to be an electrician, 100 kids from Detroit apply online to the electrical union to become an apprentice. They have to take a test, they have to pass a drug test. Everybody would say, well, it's drug tests that fail. It's not drug tests. They can't pass the aptitude test because they have to do one simple algebra equation. And so out of every 100 kids that apply, guess how many get accepted? Six. Six. 
We have to um, listen to the educators. And finally, I tutored two boys in Detroit Public School, and I learned firsthand every one of those boys wanted to succeed. He didn't have the tools. So you have to start at the grassroots. You have to start with the business people. And there are others. I, I, I represent business. But the beauty of the coalition was there was 32 people of a wide variety of political interest, religious interest, uh, geographical interest, racial interest. The list goes on and on. It was a rainbow coalition. And when I showed up for the first time, I was one of 32 people. I was the only white Republican suburbanite on that coalition. And I asked myself, what am I doing here? And I asked them the same question. What am I doing here? And somebody stood up and said, we want you to go to Lansing. And when we decide what our agenda is, we want you to go sell it to Lansing. And I said, you want me to do that? Me? All by myself? It's not possible. I need, you need 15 people like me. You need the Bill Parfits. You need the DeVosses. You need all these people across the strait to join hands with the unions, join hands with the coalition that was already there. And you know what they did? They sat back and they said, you're right. Can we caucus for a minute? So they shooed me out of the room. They came back and they said, please recommend 15 people <laughs> that you think would be able to interface with us. And I did, and they picked eight of them to come on the coalition including people like Scott Romney and Governor Milliken's son, Bill Milliken. That helped tremendously. Then we decided, how are we going to get to this 50 questions down to 10 and leave the things we don't agree off on the side? And we had a couple of rules of engagement. Nobody in the room was held responsible specifically for the condition. We were all held responsible for the way education is today. And on every single issue we voted, and you voted like this. If you were in favor of the recommendation, you raised your hand and you did five. And if you weren't 100% sure, you did four. And if you're less sure than that, you did three. And if you're less sure than that, you did two, one, and zero. And Tanya Allen, head of the Skillman Foundation, would gaze through the audience of 32 people. At the time, it was 40 because of my eight extra additions. And she would figure out whether we had a broad consensus. And when... And we did. Almost on every single issue, we had broad consensus. Probably averaged uh, out of that five points, I averaged probably four. And we had all agreed that even if it wasn't something that I wanted to see done, that for the betterment of the kids, the coalition had to stay together. And there are many things that the coalition wanted to do that I didn't vote for, or I only voted a three or a two, but ended up on the agenda. And I promised I would go and help fight for all those. That's the kind of organization you need, and you can only do that at the local level. Now the coalition has had some success, and we've broadened it out. We've been able to get business leaders from Michigan, the Metropolitan Affairs of Corporation, which is a part of SEMCOG, to all make education number one priority. That has to happen across the state. You can't start at the legislature. That's the last stop, not the first stop. Because if you build a coalition statewide the way the city of Detroit built the coalition for the future of Detroit school children, they can't say no. Just, I want to add a little bit to that if I can. Um, the legislature is the last stop. Uh, so let's be clear, like you can't, we can, we, can sit, we can act like state policy doesn't matter, it does. Uh, and so at some point, that local activity has to roll up to coherent state-level policy and action. Um, and so at some, at some point, that conversation does have to be had statewide. I think it can start locally, and I think it's great. And I do think the Coalition for the Future Detroit School, Detroit School Children is a fabulous example of what can happen locally when folks actually decide we're going to figure out how to work together to advance an agenda. Uh, I think it's, it's fantastic. There are a couple of other ways I would come at this question around local control, though, uh, that I think are important. Uh, Superintendent Flanagan used to say that we're a local control state. He used to say it all the time. Um, and what he meant by that was that we elect local school boards, and those local, local school boards actually have a fair amount of authority. 
Uh, and to sit in a room like this and not talk about the fact that we're electing local school boards and that those elections matter is a mistake, mm -hmm. right? Those elections matter. Who's on your local school board matters immensely, immensely. I want to commend the folks who stepped up and ran for school board in Detroit, and I think Detroit did a good job of electing a school board this last go round. We've got a good board. We haven't always had a good board, and that matters. Right? It's not the only thing that matters, but it does matter. And that's a way of thinking about this local control thing, too. Um, one other thing uh, worth saying, um, and that is controversial, I know. I am a fan of mayoral engagement in public education. Uh, the mayor is elected by the entirety of that community, and that is an election that folks show up for and vote in. Uh, and while it is the third rail, and what mayor in the right mind would want to touch this issue? Right? Like, thank goodness we have mayors who are courageous enough to want to touch the issue. And so I want to commend Mayor Duggan for leaning into this issue with the support of the coalition uh, to try and figure out how to, how to help fix it. I think that matters. Thank you, Dan. Luke, one of the many things that, that John Ricolta just said was we need to listen to educators, just as businesses have to listen to customers. What are some of the key principles and things and experiences that you've had that business needs to hear and understand if business is going to get more deeply engaged in education leadership in Michigan? Yeah, so I, I have two, two big ideas I'd like to share about this. And, and these are ideas from myself as a teacher, but also I'm really trying to represent the voice of all of the teachers in the state of Michigan. And I've had an opportunity to, to talk to quite a variety of, of different teachers and, and schools throughout the year. And here's the two big ideas. The two big ideas are one, that teachers are overwhelmed. And that secondly, teachers often feel voiceless. So let me ad address the first one, that teachers are overwhelmed. Teachers are some of the hardest working people that I know. 12 hour days, working on the weekends. And And they want the success of the school and the students uh, as, as, more than anybody else. I mean, a lot of times more than the students themselves want that success. But there are so many things that are on teachers' plates right now. And I'm just going to name a few of them. And it's not that these things aren't necessary, but it's important to recognize that all of these things are ideas that teachers have to think about on a daily basis. So uh, one is high stakes test. And Eileen I uh, talked about how we want to get students thinking creatively and, and collaboratively. I think high stakes tests are putting a little bit of an overemphasis on content, and that's how we get in this world of memorizing things. Uh, teacher evaluations, although certainly necessary, uh, they're not being implemented the same way in every district. They're not being implemented with fidelity in a lot of districts, and what they're turning into for a lot of teachers around the state is a huge amount of work with no benefit to them in improving their, their, uh, the, themselves as teachers. Uh, large class sizes, I hear that over and over again when I visit different schools. I don't have enough prep time. You know, in my, in my school, I have 56 minutes to prep for the day. You know, I have 140 students, I have to grade tests, I have to lesson plan, I have 56 minutes to do that, when really I need time to collaborate with my colleagues. And I, I don't have that time to collaborate with my colleagues. And so that, like, that innovation never happens because I'm so bogged down by with some of, some of the day-to-day -day stuff that I'm, I'm working through. The other big idea I just wanted to put out there is this idea of teachers not feeling like they have a voice. And this year has been very unique for me in this position as Michigan Teacher of the Year because I've been invited to a lot of things like this where I was allowed to have a voice. But I'll tell you, a lot of times I was the only voice in the room, the only teacher voice. I was the, the trophy teacher that they put in front to say, yeah, we, we, we invo involve teachers in this decision. And the reality is that teachers have not been involved in a lot of decisions that are being made uh, at, at the policy level, even, even at the building level. And, and so teachers, uh, that wears on teachers. When teachers don't feel like they can have an impact on the system that they work in, uh, it, it makes it hard to, 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 to do a good job at your job be, because of the way you feel. So I, I'm not sure that I want to do this, but uh, could I have the, all the teachers in the room raise their hand? 
Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So I will tell you, a lot of the events that I've done this year, it has not been that way. I have been the only teacher in the room. So I appreciate the fact that there are teachers in the room, and I continue... I urge you to continue to keep teachers' voices in the room when there are decisions being made about education in the state of Michigan. Just really quickly on that, uh, in addition, the Coalition for the Future De Detroit School Children actually scheduled its meetings at times that teachers could attend, right? So that teachers could be a part of that. So, so often these things happen like this one in the middle of the day, right? And lots of us work in places where our employer actually pays for us to come, right? It's like part of our work to go show up at this thing. Teachers are being paid to be in a classroom teaching kids. They can't get here in the middle of the day. Like, so to have that conversation at a local level, you gotta have evening meetings, you gotta have early morning phone calls, you gotta have weekend meetings, those kinds of things. And to the credit of the coalition, that's the kind of thing that happened here. As you take that back to your local community, that's the kind of flexibility that you're gonna have to build into the process. One plug before I ask one more question and then we, go, we, we ask questions of you, the audience. Um, thanks to Detroit Public Television, today's panels are going to be available on demand online for anybody who couldn't be here today to, to continue the conversation. We hope you will help us spread um, that discussion in that way. One more question for all of you, and then we want to leave some time for, for Q&A. So we're, we're in an election year. Some of you are very politically engaged. What, um, what, are you, what are you hearing from the candidates for governor and legislature so far, and what is your message to them? Because leadership is going to change considerably come January. Uh, are we going to have the same conversation all over again, or, or, or might, be, we, might we be headed toward a different result? So, the, um, so there's this flow, I call it, and it goes like this, economy, jobs, Talent, skill gap, education. It's all linked together. That's number one. Number two, whatever you thought about elections in the past have been totally thrown on their ears in 2016. The influence of both parties is not as great as it used to be. Candidates today can go directly to the voter and directly to the fundraiser. And they are doing that in droves. This is what this whole Facebook thing is about the last couple of days avoiding the party structure. And so it is our responsibility to get involved in the parties because what's happened is, is that the extremes of both parties have captured the primary process. Yes. We all know that. And if we're not going to go get involved and bring this thing back to the middle where we can do such things as believe in cohesion, harmony, compromise, negotiations, transparency, somebody becomes the loyal opposition, Everything today is partisan. It's a gotcha moment. And now we've got 20 years of gotcha moments. We have no solution to our educational problem. So just like everything else in life, you have to get engaged. You've got to get engaged at the precinct level. You've got to get engaged at the county level, at the state party level, at the convention level to make sure that the candidates that we put up represent what the vast majority of the citizens of the state of Michigan want a brighter future for their kids. I completely concur with that statement. His earlier statements about starting local, I struggle with a little bit. My message to legislators would be, don't be afraid to talk about governance. It's not a third rail. On the 21st Century uh, Commission, Eileen, John Austin, myself, several others, had very positive, engaging, deep conversations about how, what should the state board do? What should the state superintendent do? What should the Department of Education do? What should intermediate school districts do? And most, and most importantly, the local school districts. It has to be coherent. It has to flow well together. You can have a lot of different types of systems of governance, but they have to interact well. And we shouldn't be afraid of that discussion would be my message to them. And, I, and it's not state versus local. Many decisions have to be made at the classroom level, the building level, the district level, a regional level, a state level, a federal level. And of course, at the state level, you get a, a, a term limited legislature. I'm going to emphasize that again. So you've got a term limited legislature that is not going to get enough years to really understand the system that basically now is the state school board with the purse. 
It's a very, very powerful entity, term limited, and, so, and it takes years to understand how the system really works. So I'd say please don't be afraid of governance. It's okay, we can talk about the elephant in the room like civil Michiganders. I, I agree we can talk about the elephant in the room uh, like civil Michiganders, uh, and that our state level bureaucrats and elected officials should be doing that. Um, boy, so many things to say. Let me start here. I worry about that state level conversation to the point that John and Dave both made because of infrastructure that has nothing to do with education, uh, with redistricting and the way redistricting has happened in this state uh, over the course of the last couple of decades, uh, which just feeds the partisan nature of our political processes, right? We've got to take that back, these fundamentals that we've got to take back, the term limited nature of the legislature so that they never gain the kind of expertise around these issues that they need, uh, which just increases the influence and importance of lobbyists uh, in all of these conversations and of money, frankly, in these conversations, uh, which makes it harder for us to actually um, get them to do what the great majority of us think needs to be done. Uh, so I think we've got to lean into those issues and to think otherwise, to think this is just an education issue, I think is to miss most of what's going on. We've got to lean into the more fundamental issues uh, confronting our democracy. That having been said, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, that having been said, yes, our state infrastructure is incoherent. Like, I didn't run for re-election of the state board either because it just didn't make sense to. That was not a body that was doing anything that made sense or anything that had, it didn't have any influence. Like, so what was the point uh, of doing that? Either we're gonna have one or we're not, and if we're gonna have one, let's actually have it make sense. Let's actually have it do something, right? I worry, though at the same time, uh, like, my personal preference would be to have one, right? To try and take education out of partisan politics uh, and make it something that actually works for kids and for educators. Um, last quick thought on this, and that is, whether, whether it should be or not, it frequently is the third rail, right? What you're gonna get in election season are a bunch of uh, really bland statements around, well, I just, I wanna help our schools do better. Well, look, so the, ask the follow-up, how, mm -hmm. right? What does that mean exactly for you? And get folks to actually take positions or at least say, I don't know, I need some help figuring out what that means, why don't you help me, right? And that'll help us get to the conversation. Eileen and Luke, I don't want to rush you. We want to hear your message to candidates this year. But I also want to point out the growing line back here of people who have something to ask this panel. So we want to make sure we give them time to do so. That's usually the best part. Please go ahead. Um, really briefly, um, uh, there, Doug Ross organized four people, uh, two Republicans and two liberals, two conservatives, two liberals, to uh, meet with every uh, endorser in the state, Farm Bureau, the unions, uh, the uh, media, and at this point, we believe that they will be asking every candidate what their platform is in education drawn from, what is it now, 10 plans, 12 plans, 22 plans? Um, uh, and I heard two candidates in the last week uh, say that education was their number one priority, two gubernatorial candidates. Um, the second thing is don't donate yourselves. Don't donate or volunteer unless any candidate that you know has a cohesive platform for education that makes sense to you and that will make sense to children and teachers. The third thing is we need to transcend, transcend local control as we move through this. We have one statewide curriculum, the Michigan Merit Curriculum. Right now there are two initiatives underway that could transform third grade reading. They're totally dependent on teacher involvement school by school, district by district. There is no way to put something else out and I'm not saying that we need to get rid of local control, but I mean, we need to find a way to move through it and get to best practices for kids. And I'll, I'll be very, very brief here. I went online this morning and I checked out the websites of several of the candidates to see what they thought about education. And I, I saw a lot of these cliches that have been mentioned uh, earlier today, that we want high quality education for all students, a brighter future for tomorrow. And, and I, I think the, that we're sending a pretty clear message here that we need to figure out what that looks like. What does that actually, how does that change what's going to happen in my classroom at East Kentwood High School and pushing the candidates to really try and define more clearly what that actually means? Thank you. Dwayne Barnes, let's, let's go to some of our questions. All right. Uh, drop your name and your question. 
Hi, I'm Scott Gillespie with uh, Coldwell Banker based out of Ann Arbor. Um, as a realtor, I have the unique situation of working with communities and individual people and kind of acting as a broker in between the two. Um, what steps can someone in my position take to best act as a force multiplier, you know, as we work with uh, the, the educational community, the local community, and the clients we serve? I have a really non-traditional response. Which, is your name Scott? Yes. Scott. Is your picture on your card, your business card? What's that? Good for you. So I have this, I, so my own theory here, why do realtors have pictures, their pictures on their business cards? The rest of us don't do that, right? I think that has to do with signaling, right? I think it's, and I don't think it's intentionally done these days, but I think it's a leftover practice, right? White folks go to white realtors, black folk go to black realtors. We end up in white and black neighborhoods, in segregated neighborhoods, in segregated schools which don't work for our kids. So my answer to that question is, get your colleagues to take their pictures off of their business cards and start using realtors who are not your race. Wow. Hi, I'm Holly Windrum with Hope Network's That's Michigan explained. Education Corps. Earlier, Doug yeah. Ross made a reference to, we need more capacity to leverage high impact teaching and learning strategies and translate those to the educators in the classroom. So I think this question is maybe a little more for Luke or for Superintendent Campbell, but whose capacity are we talking about and what kind of capacity do we need in order to get those high leverage strategies to the classroom? In the Business Leaders for Michigan report, they cited the success of Tennessee. Thank you for your example there. They hired 700 instructional coaches, trained them extremely well to coach thousands of teachers. They brought something to scale. Now they had some help. The federal race to the top money did help pay for that. But that, that's, a, that's a very important investment in teacher development. Second thing I'd say is we have to recruit and retain 100,000 outstanding educators. When you have a million and a half kids, you start running your numbers with your prep time and everything else. With the counselors, social workers, administrators, you need about 100,000 outstanding educators. So if you're in an HR department, there is your challenge. We have to figure out a way to recruit and retain 100,000 outstanding people that can connect at an intellectual level, at a social level, um, an emotional level uh, with, with our students, who, by the way, are harder to teach than when we were in school uh, because of the many, many pressures that they face. So it takes a very special person to be a teacher nowadays, more than it was when I was a teacher 30 years ago. So we have to have incredible recruitment strategies. Money is a piece of that. Culture is a big piece of that, and that's, that's how I would answer that. And by the way, it's being done just across the, the Detroit River. They have a glut of highly skilled teachers across the river, but it's a different governance structure, and that's the difference. Boy, I love it when a panelist just, both of you, just knocked a question out of the park. Let's do it again. Next question. <laughs> I'm Sherry A. Wells. I am running for State Board of Education for the Green Party, so I don't use the words bipartisan. We have a candidate running for governor who is president of her school board and proud of some of their achievements. Uh, I'm looking at uh, um, Mr. Campbell. I was at Kalamazoo Risa yesterday, two and a half hour drive, because it had a great start collaborative meeting. That's the early childhood education, not daycare, not childcare, early childhood education. And that's not being discussed, but I think it's a very valuable part and it is discussed at the State Board of Education. I attend those meetings too. Strange thing for a candidate to do. Uh, so I'd like to know how you're saying we need to take the politics out, Mr. Campbell, and then saying we need the governor to appoint when in your own document you showed how the governors themselves have decimated the state board and our school systems. Yep. Uh, actually, what I'd be advocating for is a strong and independent state board of education. That would be my personal opinion. Some of these other states do the gubernatorial appointment, and that's fine. If that works for them, every state's got to figure it out for themselves. What I'm saying is the current structure is not working. I'd go with a strong and independent from the governor because we're such a purple state. 
We, and, and we're going to have Democrats and we're going to have Republicans. And we've got both parties are split in their philosophies. The Republican Party has kind of the charter voucher privatization part of the party. And then the more centrist that, that Governor Snyder would fit into that think more systemically. And, and depending on who, if the governor is given so much control, they can whipsaw public education. So I don't want the governor to have lots of control over education. Thank you for clarifying that. I would add just really quickly this uh, on this subject of early childhood education, uh, critically important. It's come up a couple of times in this conversation and obviously not on the agenda kind of for the conversation, but um, goes without, you know what, like goes without saying is cliche and probably wrong. It needs to be said. Uh, high quality early childhood education is a critical component of this. High quality maternal care for all of our pregnant moms is a really important part of this, right? Uh, <laughs> Preterm birth, like preterm birth rates, uh, preterm births actually are a challenge when, it, when that child gets to education, like to our education system. Uh, so great maternal care matters, which just feeds the fact that this is all a loop. There's this comic that you've all seen where like one institution points to the next one, right? The K-12 educators point to the early childhood educators who point to the hospitals who are caring for the moms who are pointing to the workforce development folks who are pointing to colleges, pointing to high schools and so on. Like it's everybody's fault, right? So it is, it's all of our collective responsibility and fault and we've got to figure out how to fix it and early childhood is a part of that. Yep. We owe it to you to stay on time. So we've got about three minutes. Please, let's fit in a couple quick, more quick questions. Hi, my name is Victoria Bell. Um, you can Google the Concrete Oasis Project to find out more about me. But as an ed engineering education major, I wanted to propose a collaboration between foundations and businesses to create a statewide teacher listening project. Um, if you expect to uh, have any type of recruitment and retention processes that are going to actually work, you need to actually find out what strategies, methods, best practices, challenges that the teachers are actually facing before you can address what they're doing in the classroom that's going to lead to um, a stronger workforce for the state of Michigan. Thank you. Thank you, great idea. Let's go to the next question. Dr. Richard Ziley, co-president of the State Board of Education. I'd like to point out that I was uh, uh, proudly uh, elected co-president by a bipartisan majority of the board, as was my co-president, Cassandra Ulbrich. I'd like to point out for the disillusioned board members on the panel mm -hmm. that the average superintendent, state superintendent of schools serves for something less than three years. Our state board appointed Michael Flanagan, who served 10 years, was the longest serving superintendent, highly respected by all of you here in this room. We also, uh, the point is that we have had continuity in our administration through very different administrations. This is a function of the current structure. How anyone can maintain that it has been ineffective and bad for Michigan is beyond me. Hi, uh, my name's Steve. Uh, I'm a retired educator. And over the last 15 to 20 years, teachers and teacher unions have been scapegoated and bashed as the problems with education. Uh, what can you, what do you think can be done to raise the, re-raise the profession of educator to the pedestal it deserves to be on? Thank you. That'll be our last question and it's, and it's a great one. How do we bring respect to the to One, the one thing I would do in this little pack of information I gave you, the last page talks about the school finance collaborative. There is a significant funding problem within public education in Michigan. The most interesting thing about this school finance collaborative is the amount of time to go really deep into the systems and how they studied it. It's extremely thorough. And some things that maybe are not in the talking points, but if you dive into the 300 page report, you're gonna see that it builds a system and structure, appropriate class sizes, appropriate counselor student ratios, appropriate staffing ratios that would be guaranteed to the student. And so that's the kind of thing that I, can, I think can build the profession. It's the kind of thing they're doing across the river in Ontario, is, a, is setting those, those class sizes, setting the, the, the support services. Of course, we've got, uh, what I've heard anyway, is dozens of classrooms in this city today that don't have a teacher. 
it's March for God's sake. It, it's just a tragedy that we've got such a massive teacher shortage, particularly in areas such as math, science, special ed, th those highly marketable areas. And we just, we don't have a, a logical system to recruit and retain and compensate people appropriately. It can be done, there are solutions. Thank you very much to our panelists.